Tough for Shove. Well, oh, and welcome to Tom Rhodes Smart Camp. Today's episode is sponsored by Manscaped.com. Uh, they have amazing products. I just shaved off my bushy beard with the lawnmower. It's such a great, listen to that. Oh, and it's got a light on it. Such a beautiful instrument, feels good in your hands, and it's way better than the German beard trimmer that I was using for years. Uh, they got a great ear and nose hair trimmer. It's called a weed whacker. They got uh, really funny, interesting names for all the things. And uh, they sent me this, it's called Crop Preserver. It's ball deodorant. I've got a couple of uh, friends I think might, uh, I'm going to give that to. But uh, check it out. It's a great company. I'm really happy that they are sponsoring this episode. And all of my Smart Camp listeners get 20% off and free shipping if you use the promo code SMARTCAMP. Go check it out. It's a great company. And at the very least, um, get yourself a weed whacker or a lawnmower. This lawnmower thing is fantastic. And uh, it's my new favorite beard trimmer ever. Manscaped.com. 20% 20% off, free shipping with the promo code SMARTCAMP. Do yourself a favor. Do humanity a favor. Clean it up. Let's all look handsome. I'm so glad to see my handsome face again. Thank you, Manscaped. Madison Sinclair, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, how did you get such a um, Caucasian name? <laughs> it's my middle name. Sinclair is your middle yeah. name? Yeah. Okay. So my real last name is D-O-H-E-R. People would say do her. Okay. Yeah. So that must have been annoying in high school. Yeah. And if the high school graduation, college graduation, it was Madison Dewher. And then when I did comedy, of course, everyone was like, oh, Madison Dewher. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to have a middle name. And then I have since changed it. I took my stepdad's last name uh, a couple of, yeah, last year for Father's Day. I surprised him. Now I'm Madison Cardona. Okay. Yeah. You mean like on your driver's license and stuff? Yeah. Okay, but your your stage name is still Madison, Madison Sinclair. Sinclair. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty perfect name, I think. I like it. I feel like it works. And I was so impressed with you when I first worked with you at the Venice Underground. Mm-hmm. What was that, three months ago or something like that? Yeah, it, was, it feels like, yeah, not that Beginning long Beginning of this year. Because um, you said you were from Florida, so my, my ears peaked up, and then I talked to you after the show, <laughs> and you're from Apopka. Yeah. Which I just, that blows my mind, and I'm... I'm I mean, the fact that you're from Apopka, you're living in Los Angeles, and you're chasing that stand-up comedy dream, I think um, I um, I applaud that wholeheartedly. Yeah, I feel like I didn't think that it was uh, an option, but I had dated a guy in Tallahassee who, um, he told me that he wanted to be a stand-up comic, and I was like, that's stupid. That's You bad. stole his dream? <laughs> Basically. Really? Because he, like, he was like, oh, he's like, what do you want to be? And I was like, I want to be a lobbyist. Um, but that I, was what you wanted to be original? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I was working for the Capitol, um, and I liked in it. In Tallahassee? Yeah. Like, what kind of, like, filing um, like, petitions to get ordinances <laughs> changed? Like, what no. What kind of thing does a lobbyist do? Uh, well, I was I was just an administrative assistant, an intern, um, so I was just, like, was taking notes for the... I worked for this Republican senator, actually. Um, she was wild she the only interview question she asked me is if i ever if i ever drank alcohol and i was told beforehand just to say no um so i said no she was against alcohol yeah okay like wholeheartedly i don't know why but yeah. drugs and i, I didn't gay ask her sex how- is fun. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't ask her if she stands at cocaine <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um I was just in college still. I was. Uh, you went to Florida State. Yeah. Oh my God, my sister went to Florida State. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. We're a Seminole family. Uh, when do you know when you graduated? Uh, oh. Hmm. I don't. Okay. Well, let me see. Um. I don't know why. Ninety five. I think ninety six. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think don't so. know why. None of my family went to college. So I don't know why I asked that question? <laughs> I'm the first in my family. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It was, it was, I feel like it's, uh, it was cool to be the first. And, uh, it's, I think Florida State's like the best school in Florida. Um, I liked it. It was just like too much of a party school. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like insane. I don't know. It's a lot. But you were, you're working for the, uh, congresswoman? Yeah. I was working for a congresswoman. And, and going to FSU, that's, yeah. That's a pretty impressive resume to start with. Yeah. I feel like I was always really ambitious. Um, but I, I always, I wrote jokes since I was 12 and 
he said he wanted to be a comic, so I was, like, showing him all these jokes I've been writing over the years. And he's like, why don't you do this? And I was like, I just didn't think it was practical. I was like, I don't think I would make any money off of this. It just seems like, why would I go to college just to be a comedian? Um, and then we, he went to Toronto to do jokes. And I guess this guy told him, hey, you're so funny. I'll give you a job here. I have a, I have a guest house that you can rent out. Move, move here. You, you're set. And he called me. He said, hey, I used some of the jokes that you gave oh, me. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> he stole your act? He, he stole my joke. <clears throat> well, I didn't even do it at the point, so I guess it's, he like thought it was fair game. Yeah. Um, broke up with me because he said I'm moving to Toronto. And then it turns out that guy was just like on coke, and it was just like an empty promise. And he followed up on it. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. We can't hire you right now. Like We can't make any hires. And also, I already have someone for the guest house. So then, Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so that guy lied. Yeah. yeah, the guy, okay. he was just, like, making promises that weren't coming through. So, like, a week later, he That's, called So me. he shows up in Toronto with his bag, or <laughs> well, was it... He was already there doing shows. Okay. So he's like, I'm just going to stay here. So did that guy you were dating, is he still doing stand-up? Yeah. Okay. He means he's not doing well, but... Okay. You're... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the karma for joke thieves. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you, are, you, are you still in contact with the guy? Uh, some uh, he he unfollowed me. So I oh. he a few years ago. So I I unfollowed him back. Uh, but I guess he's I mean he's doing okay. He's yeah, because like, my next question was, does he know that you're crushing it in Los Angeles? I think it it makes him really angry. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> it was like immediate. It was imme- as soon as I moved here, I, I started getting writing <clears throat> jobs and stuff. And he I think he had a little bit of resentment towards that because he was like this. You said this was a stupid idea, <laughs> which I kind of it's kind of fun to for someone to break up with you and then you just steal their dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've never had that happen, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. So, uh, how was, how is, did a popka influence you and in your, who you are as a person today? Well, I grew up in Winter Garden. My parents moved to a popka after I moved out. Okay. So, Winter Garden, it's like, I don't know. I guess <clears throat> I was kind of in a bubble in Windermere because it was like, the people who were Windermere is like kind of a rich area. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I grew up I grew up rich and then my parents separated and he really screwed my mom over in the divorce and then I was like very poor. So it was like weird to like get accustomed to having money and then not having it at all. Um but I feel like I was in a bubble. Like I didn't experience like blatant racism until until I was in Tallahassee because I think that like people in Windermere like they are definitely just as racist but they're like they're quiet about it. And also, like, the richest kids in our school were, were black, so I feel like it was, I had, like, an idea that we were further ahead than we were. And then I went to Tallahassee, and I was like, oh, this is so much worse than I could have ever imagined. Like, they would have Confederate parties and stuff like that. Oh, in Tallahassee? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, they would wear these, like, weird hoop skirts, and, like, they'd dress up like Confederate soldiers. Oh, my sister um, yeah. uh, studied theater, so she was with the theater okay. people. So uh, Probably way more liberal and They, cool. they yeah. were uh, <laughs> I didn't hear about any Confederate parties <laughs> happening. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> they heard gay friends and actor friends, and those were the people I met when I went there. I should have been a theater kid. I feel like I would have found out I was gay sooner, and I probably would have had a better time than being in the sororities because I was in two sororities when I was in Florida State, and I hated it. Really? Yeah. What, um, what, did, you, what did you dislike the most about it? So... The, the other than the fact that it's a dating service for friends <laughs> it's well yeah and also it's like really expensive like i use my student loans to be in a sorority which is crazy oh you have to pay them yeah it's like oh. twenty five hundred dollars a semester oh no yeah really it's like extremely expensive so it's like a homeowner's association yeah. <laughs> uh fee for on top of your regular fee yeah and like they feed you every day okay. so there's that um but it's still like it's a lot of money like you can probably just eat for the price that that is. But the first one I was in was like the top tier one. And it was, uh, they did all this like weird hazing. Like it was like, I remember like they told us to get really dressed up and, uh, that we were going to go out and they said, we're going to take your picture. Like try to look the best you've ever looked. We spent hours getting ready. We got there and they just, they threw water on us as soon as we walked in the door. Um, which was like weird, like mind things. And one time they asked us to show up without makeup. And then that was picture day. And mm. her pictures were us, like, without makeup. And I was like, what weird girl bullying. Hilarious. <laughs> and then, the, so the older 
ones with seniority laugh and yeah right i and sort of belittling others yeah and there's not the whole thing is that it's supposed to be like community and stuff and and then aren't you supposed to date like only guys from a certain fraternity that's like connected to that sorority well this is like since this was like a high tier sorority (laughs) they were like they would only you should only date people that were in the high tier fraternities because they're like oh we're the hottest sorority so you have to only be with the people that are like pike or whatever um and that's why I ended up getting kicked out of this first sorority I was in, like, pretty quickly. Because um, you were dating beneath your, your station? <laughs> no. I, uh, this girl got, there's this thing called minor in possession, where it's like you're drinking underage in Florida, you just get, you get, you get, like, you get a ticket. It's not really a big thing, but it's a misdemeanor. Um, and this girl got a minor in possession. It's, like, two grand. Like, it's not great. And then I worked at a bar uh, called the, at the Strip. And she was there again drinking with X's on her hands. And I told her, I said, you're going to get another minor in possession. And I told her that there was uh, there was people that worked at the, I probably shouldn't have said the place's name. Uh, <laughs> I told her that there were security guards that were selling, they, they found people's IDs on the floor and they were like, it, it's selling them. And I was like, oh, I said, you can just get one from the IDs they find. And she bought one from them. And then she went to this judicial board, which is called Standards. And like they wear weird cloaks and it's like, court but it's sorority girls and when she was in sorority girl court for getting her minor in possession she said madison selling fake ids and i was like i'm not selling them i just oh, told no. you that <laughs> this is a situation that and that's how you got kicked out yeah they said we heard you're selling fake ids and i'm like i'm not selling fake ids i told her about something like if someone says hey i, I hear they're sell drugs in that corner it's gonna right. be a drug dealer <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but i was it was a blessing because the second place i went to was like way more chill and, like, they didn't have makeup requirements. There's makeup requirements in these sororities. Really? Yeah. Like, if you are wearing letters, you have to have your hair done, and you have to have full face of makeup. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And you, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't be in sweatpants. Ever? With the letters With the on. letters on, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So, are you still friends with any of these women? No. One of them actually is a murderer now. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> she uh, got really drunk and got in behind the wheel of a car... She was driving 80 miles per hour through campus, and she killed this girl, like, on impact. On the FSU campus? Yeah. She killed someone. Killed someone. Wow. Her friends were there freaking out, uh, like, oh, my God. Uh, and she just backed up, drove away, went home, took her uh, her license plate off, replaced it with another license plate. Oh. Um, so she wasn't that drunk, because she was conscious enough to, like, know to do to that. To know how to cover up a murder. Yeah. Yeah. Washed the blood off her car. Wow. And everything. Um clearly didn't know how license plates work because it's like you can put a new license plate on but they still connect it so they connect it to your parents you um, have the big dent on the front <laughs> there's <laughs> skull matter in the, yeah. on the, in the hood ornament um, and they were like yeah like we don't know they're like yeah it's her daughter she lives at this address they went there asked for questioning she denied it all they found the footage of it and she's still in prison Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah, because it would be one thing if she had, like, stopped and did the right thing. But the fact that she took so many steps to cover it up. Yeah, I mean, and then hit hit and run killing somebody. Yeah, and I think she also fled once she found out they were after her. So did she get to stay in the sorority? (laughs) (laughs) I know, I heard that. I'm like, I'm not that bad. (laughs) She she had makeup and her hair was done. As long as she has a full face of makeup in prison, she can still <laughs> be in the sorority. So you, so you grew up in Windermere? Yeah. Okay, and that's kind of a rich area and yeah. everything. So, and you never had any inkling of being gay when you were growing up in Florida? I just thought everyone just, thought women were attractive. And I thought that everyone didn't find men attractive because the way women talk about men, they act like they're disgusting and they act like they're annoying and like you don't really hear women like lust after men a lot and talk about them in ways that they're like enthusiastic about them. So That's I was, what I was telling you earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, so I was like, oh. So when you, when you find one, you should hold on to it. That was my point that we were talking about. That's it exactly. It's very rare. It's, it's weird. So I just thought that no one was attracted to men. And then I found out, no, <laughs> that was not the case. Um, like I was always weirded out by, like I was, not attractive to like muscular men or like when guys would be have abs and be shirtless. I remember thinking, like, oh, that's so gross. And now I realize that was because I'm gay. Like anything, like I liked very feminine looking men. Like the only like like the guy, some of the guys I dated, we wore the same jeans. <laughs> so. 
28 inch waist yeah <laughs> um but you're you're mm. you're you're a very attractive woman thank you and you look like in a florida town you could be like a homecoming queen thank you i wasn't i was very uncool okay yeah i had a speech impediment until i was 15 when like what you had your lisp uh my r sounded like w's so if i said like sorry i said sorry and i said bird i said boyd and it was just like i just sounded like a big baby Okay. And it's like, like how a toddler talks, and it's like cute when they're a toddler, but then once you like get tits, it's, you're an adult. It's weird. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty cool that you're making your living as someone who speaks publicly. Yeah. That you've overcome it. It's and it took a lot. It took like 15 years of. You know, like, apparently Moses had a stuttering problem. <laughs> he did. You know? Really? Yeah. Really? How yeah. do we even know it, that? I mean, it's like in the Bible. Oh. And it's I've, I've heard it uh, at churches. Oh. And that he was. He didn't want to be the chosen dude. And, and, then, and God said, don't worry, you're going to be okay. You're, when the time comes, you're not going to stutter. And then, oh, <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was like a little plank. Um, I thought you were making it, I thought you were just comparing me to Moses. I am. Because it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I want you to part the Red Sea. So uh, what are like some of the, you know, because like I grew up in Oviedo. Yeah. And that's why I got excited when you said, you told me you were from Apopka, but mm -hmm. now there's a bigger story behind it. Because yeah. I pictured you, like, growing up in kind of the same redneck surroundings that I did. <laughs> um, you know, like, where I, uh, when I grew up in Oviedo, it was like the perfect, charming little town. I guess there was a lot of things I didn't realize, mm -hmm. you know, like um, racism and things like that. It just wasn't on my radar, and... Um, I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, certain rednecks uh, making slurs, but yeah. they weren't really my friends. And I, mm -hmm. you know, um, but like the people I grew up with in my little town, I thought it was a really perfect uh, place to grow up. And I think it has a lot to do with who I am as a person. And I just went back there a few weeks ago when I was visiting my mother and it was when I grew up in Oviedo. There was one stoplight and a tractor crossing, <laughs> and now it's God. There's so many like fast food restaurants, mm -hmm. and it's um, you know capitalism has um, had its way with my uh, my darling little hometown. It's terrifying. They keep knocking down like huge stretches of trees, and you'll see like all the animals like trying like run across the road and stuff like that. It's, it's because they keep building like these weird apartment complexes. And I remember thinking, oh, apartment probably was really cheap in Apopka, because, like, who wants to live here? $1,400. Wow. For an, yeah. In Apopka. I was like, I could live, I could, you could get an apartment all day here for $1,400. Yeah. So did yeah. you, um, did you grow up with a lot of, like, redneck people, or what was your, you said you were kind of weird because you had a speech impediment. Well, I was in private school until eighth grade. Okay. So it was, like, really small, like, 50 Groups. There was uh, okay. See you now again. I yeah. thought you had this kind of like you know we had this redneck commonality yeah. thing, but clearly you're a rich kid and you were <laughs> you went to private school. Well, my <laughs> my grandma's a redneck, uh, and that whole family we have family trees that interweave, and uh, it's definitely in me. But I think my mom just like fought so hard to like get out of it because she was so like ashamed of her roots. Was it your grandmother? You told me, boy, this really stuck with me when we <laughs> talked, and you said um, she's really against interracial <laughs> yes. uh, relationships. Her, her husband is. Oh. Yeah. And said that a cardinal should never be with a blue jay? <laughs> yeah, that's how she defended Because she, because they were talking about Kylie Jenner, and he goes, oh, he goes, he goes, I just don't like that. And he, she thought, oh, I didn't know he had an opinion on the Kardashians. And she's like, oh, yeah. She's like, I don't really like them either. And he's like, no, he's like, I mean her being with Travis. Like, that was what he specifically had a problem with. <laughs> She's like, wow. Wow. Because my stepdad's, uh, he's Hispanic, so it's just weird that they, like, make such a point about not wanting interracial people together, but... Yeah. Yeah. And, like, they know that that's the case, and, like, they're super nice to him. Well, it's funny. My mom is an immigrant from Argentina, mm -hmm. and she's the most anti-immigration person you'll ever meet <laughs> in your life. She, she we're full, close the door. That's, that's, uh... That's too much. It's uh, it's it sucks. My grandma's like she thinks she's she's a bit of a lost cause with it. Like she's still not vaccinated, and she's had like three strokes. Like she needs to be vaccinated, but she's very uh, 
And, she's, and she doesn't think she's racist, but she just has to mention people's race all the time. And then she starts talking. Like, she'll talk, if you talk to an Asian person, like, she'll talk with an Asian inflection. She talks to with the Hispanic person. Like, <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, she claims she doesn't know that she's doing it, but it's, like, super offensive. <laughs> <laughs> like, and the person could be Asian and, like, just be born here, like, second generation immigrant and just, like, talk perfect English, but she'll, like, start talking, like, broken Vietnamese to them. And I'm like, why are you doing Let's this? Let's hear it. Do an impression. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <clears throat> so, and your family's, your family's pretty religious, too, right? Yeah. On my, my stepdad's super religious. I actually found out that he used to... So, my friend... Uh, who I found out recently grew up, he was in a popka too. He used to be a youth group leader at this place called Faith World. And they like set up an arranged marriage for him. And like years later, he found out it was a cult. And I ended up in a, in a cult when I was in Orlando too. And I was, it's a different one because like, there's a lot of negative. What kind of cult? It was called Adrenaline. It was like a Christian cult. And it was, a, I didn't realize it was a cult until I was studying theology in college. And it like, it hit every single like qualification for it. Uh, uniforms, like they had, we did wear certain shirts. There was like different colors to different levels of it. You had to be tapped to get to a different level. Like we think you're ready to move on. Um, just like not really. I just thought that was how churches work because I had never been to a church before. And then I found out now it's like an actual cult. But I found out my stepdad had gone to this cult that my friend got sucked into. He thought it was just, he just went there on Sunday, so he didn't know it was a cult. Wow. Yeah. So what did you have to do? Like, um, Drive a bus and go <laughs> preach at malls and things like that. Uh, what were the what were the like the, cult activities? That... Well, we we went to we when the hur- the hurricanes happened. It was like some devastation happened in Haiti. We did this thing for the Red Cross, so we went to this like camp, and we would go and we'd help out the Red Cross during the day, and then every night we did do these like very intense sessions, where we would like have these uh was, like, this preacher would would do these things and they would like make us admit things that we've done and like i was like 14 i was like i've never (laughs) i don't have anything to admit i hadn't done anything bad yet i feel like i had strict parents but this one kid made the mistake of telling the preacher that he looked at at pornography and then he made him stand up and in front of like maybe 200 of us just like went into detail about the kind of pornography he looked at how often he was looking at it oh well and it was just humiliating but they would do like public humiliation and ways like that and also they would make us separate and go into the woods and try to talk to God. And uh, I remember we'd come back and like we had this little circle. And we were supposed to share stories about like what God said to us. And I was like just sitting there and I was like trying to talk to God and I didn't hear anything. And I was like, what the, what's wrong with me? And then I come back and then everyone has a story and I was like, oh my God. Everyone like, talked to God but you. Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but then I, now I realize people are just fucking lying. But. At the time, like maybe God doesn't like me. <laughs> Why well, was that? was weird about like the Catholic Church because I yeah. uh, I was Catholic mm-hmm. as a kid. You know, my family went to Catholic Church with confession. It's such a weird premise that you go into the booth mm-hmm. and then the priest he's in the booth, but you can't see him. He's behind a screen. Mm-hmm. So like you're saying about like the you know okay tell everyone about the pornography and go into detail about what you're watching. I always had that image of the, 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 the priest at confession going, okay, when you said you, you, you grabbed um, <laughs> Jenny's breast in the car when you were making out, could you go over that again slowly? <laughs> um, and, and tell me, did you, did you unbutton the shirt or did, did you go up under, was it a solid shirt you went under? Okay. And at what point did you make the move to unbutton her pants? Like, okay, very slowly tell me, you know, and he's like, is this, what are you doing in there? What's, 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 what's that rhythmic sound I'm hearing? I, I wonder, it just always feels like it's a blackmail for like leverage for the church, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Like they just try to, it's like kind of what the church of Scientology does. They try to know like your deepest secrets and kind of use it against you in a way. Yeah. But I don't know. It was. I it, saw Putin rose to power. Oh, yeah. He was in the KGB, and he collected information on all these uh, uh, political people. Oh. Like photos, affairs, weird sexual kink shit. And so he had dirt on everybody, and that's how he he rose so high in the ranks so quickly. Do you think that he had stuff on Trump? you believe that? Um, I think... Uh, 
I think he, he I, I think he probably does have some uh, information on Trump that would um, <laughs> make everyone uh, <laughs> sit up and um, gasp. I'm sure. I feel like I, he's he's so like comfortable being. He doesn't have any embarrassment though. So, but it does seem like he has like a, a pull, like he had some kind of leverage on him. Yeah. Well, for Trump to be so subservient to Putin mm-hmm. for the, his entire administration, yeah, and that's the thing I don't understand about like these the real hard right people mm-hmm. who are are, are pro Putin and everything is <laughs> that, uh, and especially the Republicans were the anti communism party, and as much as they love Reagan, I mean, I was in high school when Reagan was was president. Um, you know, I didn't know. Too much about politics, but it, it was like a real good, feel-good time in America. Yeah. And it was great that the Russians were our enemy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> to have like a clear-cut enemy uh, was really uh, kind of a uniting thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, for them to be, for certain hard-right people in the Republican Party, like Tucker Carlson, <clears throat> and these people to be pro-Putin and, and pro-Trump... And that's, uh, I'm not pro-Trump, uh, pro-Putin and pro-Ukraine uh, war. Yeah. Um, the fact that Trump was so subservient to Putin, I find really disturbing. And like when he stood in Helsinki next to Putin and he said, um, I'm going to take Putin's word over our intelligence services. Yeah. So all of our intelligence services, everything they've told you, all the information that was collected... <laughs> You're going to take this scumbag, <laughs> the guy who fucking poisons people, <laughs> all of his political opponents? I mean, I think um, uh, there's, I mean, it's, it, it's beyond hypocrisy. I think it's, yeah. I think, um, I think there's a lot of dirty Russian money in uh, the Republican Party. It's... And, I, and I, I, I think Trump had so many businesses there. Um, he really acted like he was Putin's little bitch. Yeah. And I think um, the fact that Republican people don't have a problem with that, and that even now they're pro-Putin after what he's doing in Ukraine is, um, it's uh, it's pretty sad. It's totally, the whole Republican Party, the whole thing is America first, and like not, to not like kind of want to help any other country, so it's weird that they're... Right, want to yeah. <laughs> yeah, be so um, <laughs> locked in with the Russians. Yeah, your yeah. tradition. This is the most anti-American. Like that was. I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. that's as anti-American as you can get. To want to side with the Russians over compromising with um, your own citizens, like <laughs> um, Democrats who might have a pro-gay agenda or wanting to help um, less fortunate people of color mm-hmm. and things like that. To um, to just say. Fuck the other half of the country. I mean, that's my brother John. He's just uh, he he um, he said uh, thousands of times through the years, Democrats should be shot in the street like dogs. Jesus. <laughs> and um, it it looks like that is uh, it's just it's starting to happen. Yeah, it's terrifying. It's, it's pretty terrifying. That's how we, COVID's over though. Shootings are back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Terrifying. Very terrifying. Do you own a gun? I uh, do not own a gun. I looked into it. I was like, I, w- I, w- I don't like guns, but I would have one as like a woman who lives alone. I have like a little tiny. I was looking at one of like one of those little tiny prostitute guns. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> what kind you keep in your boot type thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If anyone gets too handsy or stiffs you, <laughs> uh, I'm 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 actually I'm pro gun. Yeah. But I think that there should be, um, I, I don't think there should be assault rifles. I don't think. Yeah. Those, I don't. Th- I don't think regular citizens should have assault <laughs> rifles. I mean, look at you know what what keeps happening, and um, and I think there should be background checks. Yeah. I mean, it's like just simple, basic, uh, yeah. and and that, and I think. Uh, you know, people should have guns, but I think it it should be kept out of the hands of of lunatics and troubled people. Yeah, I think like at, the AR fifteens are insane. Like I, my uncle has one, and it's just he was like shooting it in his backyard, and I was like, this is no you one couldn't have eat this. the meat 
that you shot with an AR-15. No. It's like, well, well, it's for hunting. But how you can't eat a, a, an animal that's got hundreds of bullets in it. Yeah. The only argument that he would, he's like, but what about if boars attack you? And I'm like, boars aren't going to attack you. And also you can just shoot, I think you can just shoot a boar normally with a handgun, maybe. Well, I mean, some manly <laughs> people go out and hunt boars with knives. Yeah. You know? If you're an actual hunter, I think, I don't know. You should earn it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think I could hunt. I like animals too much. It would make me too sad. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I went skeet shooting a couple times. And I was really good at it. Really? And I don't think I could ever shoot an animal. But I'll fuck up a clay plate. <laughs> you know? So are, are you? did you grow up shooting guns? Um, I dated an abusive guy in, in college who loved guns. Was this the military guy you told me about? Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, he had like an arsenal of guns. Um, and he always wanted to take me shooting. And we'd go to this outdoor shooting range. And those places are so dangerous and unregulated. Because you have to go and change your own thing and no one oh. runs it. Yeah. So you just have to say clear. The and, target thing. Yeah. And you have to walk across the fire line to change. Shouldn't they target? use a new target? It's always like that, like kind of nineteen fifties guy, and he's got like the he's got the eye mask on. Like, I, don't, I don't think criminals are wearing those eye mask things anymore. Well, someone got in trouble because they, they they wanted to use one that had a dog on it, and they wouldn't let him do it With in a the dog? shooting range. It had a drawing of a dog. On it. Oh, and there's one that had a drawing of a police officer, and they were like, "You can't mm. do that." They like regulate what the drawings can be of. But I think it's like it should. You can put whatever you want in there. <laughs> well, they'll censor books, but not, uh, <laughs> but not... target shooting, <laughs> shooting range targets. I was always terrified that because you have to yell clear, and it's just a bunch of old veterans who like are, probably have no hearing, and they have their. On top of that, they have the little things in their ears, so it's like they're completely deaf. And you have to have to wave to make sure and just hope you're not going to shoot you as you walk across and change your own target. But I had a pretty good shot. I liked it for that. But I, that's why I was like, after I, I had this guy try to break into my apartment when I, when I first moved back to L.A. And you were in the apartment at the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, was, uh, I had taken an edible and I was putting up wallpaper. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and having a great time. Uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have a shirt on. And the guy saw it and I guess was videotaping me. Uh, and I had no idea. He, then my neighbor saw it. They called the cops. The cops took 45 minutes to get there. Um, you didn't close the curtains when you took off your top to put up the wallpaper? <laughs> I have, like, this protective screen that mm-hmm. I thought would completely block it out because it's supposed to, like, make it so that you can't really see in. But I guess if you get close enough, it, you then you can, which I don't know. I've never, like, tried to peek into my own window. Um, so he was he was out there for, like, 45 minutes. The cops came there. They saw him, and then the way the cop wanted to alert me at 3 a.m. that the guy had a peeping Tom and that he was trying to break in was he banged on my window really loud and said, come outside. So I, like, yelled. I was like, I'm going to call the cops. He said, I am the cop. I said, prove you're the cop. And he showed me he had a flashlight. Mm. And I was like, well. That proves it. (laughs) (laughs) They don't give out flashlights to just anybody, you know. (laughs) (laughs) But I looked outside, and I was like, there's a bunch of cop cars. And he's like, yeah, he's like, he said he's a peeping Tom, but I think he, he said he's just peeing, and we believe him. <laughs> so I guess he had his penis out. <laughs> um, and uh, the next day I looked over, and he had unscrewed my windows. He was, like, trying to break in. So I was like, oh, maybe I should get a gun. But right now I only, I got a sword. It was the first thing I got. <laughs> I have a medieval sword. <laughs> Is it sharp? Oh, it's extremely sharp, yeah. Okay. It's like a $700 sword. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's not just... Uh, lonely guys who are buying those swords. No, <laughs> it's, it's lonely guys and me. Because <laughs> I also feel for self defense, it would just be terrifying just to see a woman with a eighteen inch sword. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was thinking a couple. I guess a, a year or so ago, mm-hmm. I was thinking about getting a gun, but the um, the desire has passed. You have to like leave LA too, because like they don't they like overprice them here, because like no one in LA really wants one. Oh, do they really? See, I, yeah. I didn't go that far. Yeah, I was like, I get, I made the mistake of signing up for, there's only one place that has them really, and it's this Burbank place, and I get the notifications. It's always terrifying, because they're like, have these like semi-automatic weapons, and they're like, spent thousand dollars off, and it's like these like horrible, terrifying looking weapons that are always on sale, mm-hmm. and then they have these weird, they, it was like for MLK Day, <laughs> get an AR-15. Wow. <laughs> I was like, wow, they, uh. 
have all these really inappropriate specials all the time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Is your local Starbucks getting on your nerves? Are you, are you tired of sending in complaint emails? This weekend only. So, um, the, uh, what other, like, what other happy stories about Florida can you tell me? Um. What do you love most about Florida? What do I love most about Florida? I love my mom, and she's there. Yeah, that's, and, that's how I feel. Yeah. So that's why I always like, I mean, I'd love for her to move here. That would be, it'd be nice. Because um, I feel like my mom's not, like, totally accepted in Florida and, like, doesn't. What? T- she, like, dress like, she has, like, a really cool sense of style and Dresses stuff. too nice. Yeah, <laughs> like, she's, like, dresses kind of edgier, too, and I think that she's, like, an artist. She has all this cool art. What and kind of art does she do? She paints. Oh, nice. And my it, mom paints. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, nice. it's, it's, I just feel like there's, like, not a lot of, she also does makeup and, like, does makeup artistry, and I just feel like there's not as much of an industry out there, so I wish she could be out here, but. Would I, she like to live out here? Oh, she would kill to live out here. It's just so expensive. Yeah. And they have a house, and. I don't know if I told you I went to. A church with my mom, mm-hmm. and uh, she's living in Mount Dora. Yeah, and um, it's Florida. It's hot, you know. So most everybody's wearing shorts and flip flops, and there are like four or five guys wearing baseball hats. <laughs> and the pe- pastor was doing this sermon about you shouldn't waste your money on nice clothes because uh, God knows who you are as a person. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking they've heard this one. Before. <laughs> <laughs> So your mom's too stylish for a popka. I think so. I think she's too cool for a popka. But that's where they live. And my stepdad just opened a salon. So they, they're like kind of tied there. Okay. Yeah. Did she cut hair or makeup or what does she do? There? She does makeup, but like my, my stepdad is a hairstylist. So he just, oh, okay. Yeah. So he owns a salon and works there. And he just opened it like last year. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So when did you, it, it was kind of recent that, now what, did, did you know you were, Gay before you started doing stand up, or was that after the fact? Uh, I started doing stand up when I was twenty. I don't think I knew. I, I didn't even think it was an option because I thought that like lesbians were, and women who even like by I thought they were like butch. Like I thought they were like all just like, and I'm not attracted to like very masculine looking women. So I just thought that oh, I'm not attracted to that, so it's not an option. And then my best friend that I grew up with in high school, like now looking back, like I took her to prom. She's a lesbian now. <laughs> Um, and I, I just had never even th- in a million years thought that she would be gay or even like women. Um, and then once I realized it was more of an option, like I had always dated, it had started dating apps when I was in LA and I would open it to both, but I never really like bit the bullet and like actually like went on dates with people until it wasn't until I, I went to Thailand that I realized I was like fully gay. Now, and this is the story why I invited you on the podcast. <laughs> uh, this, this, I think, is uh, one of the most remarkable stories ever. <clears throat> you 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 realized you were gay when you were in Thailand. So, um, please um, re- re- regale the listeners um, with this uh, this this wonderful story. So. I like to travel alone, and I was in Thailand for three weeks because we had a stop off on this. Sh- I was working on this ga- this MTV Game of Thrones uh, Game of Clones show, and so we had three weeks off. And I was like, I'm going to go to Thailand. I was there. I was kind of going all over, and I ended up towards the end of my of my trip. I was in Bangkok, and I I knew that they had like I was getting massages the whole way through, but they were not offering me anything. The happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard that it's such a thing. Like, it was such a thing to the point that, like, my friends were working for Miss Universe, and they were like, he, they asked for massages, and they were like, you want jerk off? And <laughs> they had to be like, no, we don't want it. Because uh, it was just, even at a really nice hotel, they, like, just offer it over there. Um, So I, I just, I had decided at this point, like, I want to find a place that offers this. And I, I looked in my act. I say I didn't know, but I did. I, like, looked at it. I looked for places. I called ahead. I asked them if they uh, offer if they would do women, and she said, "There's one girl there that does women." And I showed up, and they were all just like very like laugh. You could tell they were like nervously laughing, like they they couldn't believe because I guess I'm not their typical demographic. It's usually just like gross men that go into these places. <laughs> and uh, I went back there, and she and I took my clothes off, and the first thing she said uh, was, "I'm so lucky." <laughs> and they like she sh- said she's lucky. Yeah. Oh. Which, I mean, not to 
not to pat myself on the back, but I'm probably, I'm probably like, I'm, this is a really, we're in a really seedy, gross place. Like I'm probably the hottest girl ever to walk into that place. I, or I think she usually just deals with really gross men that are probably handsy and shitty to her. Uh, and I was like nice and like complimentary and like, um, and they have to, they have to shower you first. So they give you a shower. Really? Yeah. So like they shower themselves and they shower you. And then you go on this. To like, get a massage? Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess because there's more than that. They want to make sure that you're clo- That's why I'm like saying that there's probably disgusting men. The fact that it's like part of the thing is that you have to shower first. Okay. Let me stop your story here. Yeah. Did you go to the temple of the reclining Buddha? <laughs> I think so. You went there. I went to a lot of the temples. I think I yeah, went to the that d- one, Yeah, the temple of the reclining Buddha? Yeah. <laughs> and it's on this grounds. It's this, mm-hmm. like, temple grounds. Yeah. And the, the reclining Buddha is actually really cool. It's this, you know, massive gold statue of Buddha reclining. <laughs> and on those grounds, in the back area, is a massage school <laughs> where they do the ancient thousand-year-old Thai massage, mm-hmm. which is really a wonderful massage. Yeah. Uh, and it's only like five dollars, seven dollars, mm-hmm. and you're in this kind of big room with maybe 50, 75 other people. So there's no privacy and there's no like dirty, um, there's no happy ending thing. It's like a legitimate massage place. Yeah. So, um, that's what I've done. <laughs> you did go to the, I didn't know, <laughs> the skeezy I, ones? I didn't know there was a place where you can shower with them. And, <laughs> and it's only like $12. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They give you like an a la carte menu. Clearly, I was in. going to the wrong place. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was just interested in the massage. <laughs> well, that was my problem, too, is I thought they massaged you, and then they gave you the happy ending. Isn't that how it works? No, she went straight to the... That, and I was oh. like, I want you to romance me. <laughs> really? Know? She just went straight for... Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, like, she showers you first, but they, they gave, they had, like, a price breakdown on this menu, too. You could decide, like, what you want, if you want, like, a table shower. They can do body to body. They can massage your body on you. I was like... No, oh, you went to, like, a real legit <laughs> prostitute massage <laughs> it was place. Like, yeah, it was like a... Oh, okay. And it was in a really and it was a in a chain of them like there was a bunch of like prostitute places all around it so it was like gross men chain smoking outside and they were just like so shocked to see me come out of there because it's and this was the place where you realized you were a lesbian yeah because i was like From oh this massage woman. <laughs> this was she very, was so talented she was her name's mary <laughs> yeah and uh yeah did you kiss her or did, did no you, no yeah, it's okay. uh, I think she would that would You just sat back like a rich white guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she wanted me to kiss her. Okay. Um, yeah, and I was uh, I mean, you feel really skeezy afterwards too, because it's like she massages you, like she like showers you at first, and then after you have to you're told to shower by yourself, <laughs> and then you realize you're on a gross <laughs> <laughs> air mattress, and uh, then you you realize you have to walk out. Go wash yourself, sinner. <laughs> And I'm just like, what did I do? And I also, I, I don't know why I did it sober. I was like, I should have had a drink before I did this. This is like a weird sober activity. But she rocked your world enough for you to change your, your lifestyle. Because I, I, yeah, I feel like I was like, oh, I'm actually like really attracted to this woman. And like, and that whenever I've been with a guy, I've never been like attracted to like a guy. turned on. Never, yeah. It's always just been, oh, he's nice. Or, oh, he helped me move. Or he's bought me dinner <laughs> five times. <laughs> So it was more transactional before. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so it was like, I never really want, like, felt the need to have sex with someone. It was just like, I just felt that I was obligated in a way. Transactional. Yeah. Took me to dinner. He helped me move. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought when I lived in Amsterdam, it was really, mm-hmm. you always hear the expression of going Dutch. Yeah. And it, it, it didn't dawn on me till I lived in Amsterdam and I would go on dates with women and they would insist on paying half. Mm-hmm. And that the um, the independent the strong independence of that of you know there's then the, the the Dutch people would say this that yeah if if I pay half there's no obligation to you you know it's a nice way to have and it on many dates I saw Dutch women bicycle away from me at the end of the night <laughs> <laughs> that's what uh, you know Ishma the book Ish- Ishmo sorry. Uh, Ismo, Ismo, the, Ismo, oh, the, yeah, fin- the Finnish, Finnish comedian. Yeah, yeah, he was saying in Finland that they uh, that it's the same way. 
he's like, he, he wasn't expecting, he's like starting to date again out here. And he's I like, thought he was married. Well, they, they got a divorce. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. So he's saying that he was like, oh, he's like, you, you have to pay for everything. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, not used to it. And Finnish, it's like, Finland, everyone, like women, like, it's almost like a sense of pride to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is in Holland as well. Which I th- guess is like <clears throat> more, it's more consensual that way. Like, it's like kind of, it's nice to not have to feel like someone owes you something. Right, like yeah. you're saying, you, you mm-hmm. had sex with guys because he helped you move, and <laughs> yeah. he bought you dinner or something. Yeah. So let's go back to that CD massage place in Thailand, <laughs> and um, I'm going to be the Catholic priest for a minute. If you could tell this story a little slower. <laughs> <laughs> was, was there oil involved? <laughs> of course there was oil involved. <laughs> You're naked. She's naked. Yeah, she because she because we I showered don't wanna, I together. Don't wanna, I'm just teasing you. I don't want to put you on the spot. But I think it's funny that she like she looked at my boobs and she was like, she's like, I'm getting my boobs done next month. She's like, I want them to look just like yours. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, thank you. And then she was asking me questions about it. I was like, all right, well, good luck with that. Like what? Do they get in the way sometimes? <laughs> She was, she's asking about like the surgery and the procedure. I'm like, well, I know that my procedure was fine, but I was in a. Oh, you've got oh, you've got um, fake ones. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I had to get fake ones because this is actually a weird story. I thought I got boobs when I was 16 because like all I ever wanted was big boobs, um, and I randomly got them, and then I realized they felt weird, like they felt like hard and like popcorny, and I was thought like maybe this isn't ha- maybe this isn't right. Um, and I had told my mom about it, and she's like, that's not right at all. Like they looked weird. And I went to a doctor, and they were like all benign tumors. So I had to get what I thought were tits removed, like right before prom. Um, you had tumors in your breasts yeah, in high school? Yeah, tons of them. Oh my god! Yeah. Wow, you're shitting me. So I had to get that out. Like they, it was like emergency surgery. Like get everything removed, and then. Uh, well, that's horrible. You know, my sister died of breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's um, that's some serious shit. I mean, now I have to get checked every you six months. You must have been terrified. Oh yeah, because it was. It just, because especially because I thought I had boobs and now it's like, oh no, I don't know what this is. And they also didn't send it off for biopsy. Like the doctor didn't like handle anything The correctly. tumors? He didn't? No. Like she said, they, she said they're benign and one looks suspicious and then I can't find any biopsy record that she did. And I can't find a lot of the medical records now. So now I'm like playing detective about like, because I was 16 when this happened, I didn't, I wasn't really in charge of my own healthcare and stuff. Right. So I've been trying. She's not in practice anymore. So it's been a really difficult trying to find exactly what that procedure was. Exactly but was this what the ever were. like a history in your family? I guess my grandma had an issue where it was like they they found. I don't know exactly. She said that she had something, and I don't know exactly what it was. But every six months, I get an ultrasound because you can't get a mammogram until you're 40 because there's too much radiation okay and they said if i got a mammogram every six months at my age i would definitely have breast cancer because it's so much radiation that you get over a period okay so i have to go and get an ultrasound because i still have like benign ones that have came back and they just have to keep an eye on it basically wow yeah so wow um i did not know that yeah so now it's like i mean it, it worked out i got fake boobs <laughs> And it's relatively low risk. It's not like, I mean, they were like just fibrinomas or most of them. Um, So, I mean, it's not really that bad, but I still worry about it. And uh, it's weird. You know, you made me sad. I've completely (laughs) forgotten about the Thai massage place. (laughs) Now I'm thinking about my sister dying of breast cancer and poor little teenage you with your... Tumor lumps in your <laughs> My breasts. tumor tits. All excited that you had boobs. And no, those aren't boobs. <laughs> They're tumors. How sad. <laughs> I wanted to keep them. I was like, that was my, number, like, my whole concern the entire time. Like, it wasn't like, how dangerous is this? Is there a potential of, am I at an elevated cancer risk? Like, I was, none of those questions. I was just like, am I, are my boobs going to be smaller? And they just were like, no. Like, they lied to me completely. And then I woke up at no boobs. Because I found out, turned out I never had boobs. <laughs> they were just tumors. <laughs> but that was my biggest. They took my nipples off and they put them back on. What? Yeah. And they and I woke up from surgery and I they didn't they told my mom all of this because again like I'm a minor so like all the specifics of the surgery they relayed to my mom because they don't want to freak you out. And she didn't tell you. No, she didn't tell me anything. So I went into all of this blind. Oh no. Um, I just know that I just knew that I was getting these out. I didn't know exactly how they were gonna do it. And then I wake up and she's like, "Hey, your surgery went well." 
uh, we took both your nipples off. And I was like, what? And she's like, and then we put them back on. <laughs> I was wow. worried that I didn't have nipples. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, they just cut around them. They put, and they're like, it's horrible. They're like hypersensitive now. So it's like, I don't wear bras because of it. But. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it can go either way, apparently. When you get your nipples taken off and come back on, they can either be completely numb or like hypersensitive. And you get the hypersensitive but, yeah, ones. Which I, is, I think is the worst one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really. Who needs to feel your nipples? You know. <laughs> So after you got this Thai massage, how much longer did you stay in Thailand? And did you go back for more massages? I went back like the ne- one more day. I think I had one more day. I think that was like my last night actually. I just headed back. Um, and then you were living in LA at the time. Yeah. Um, so then you t- changed your dating dating profile on the apps. Yeah, I think that I went. I went on my first date with a girl right after that. Her name was Olivia, um, and she was a train wreck. And she was really mean to waiters. Um, but she was so pretty. She looked kind of like Megan Fox. And that was, like, always been, like, someone I was obsessed with. So I, I kept giving this person chances, even though they were, like, not a good person. Like, we, she took me to the the lobster. You know, it's, 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 I think it's what it's called. Oh, that movie? No, it's, on, it's in Santa Monica. I think it's called the, it's called, I think it's called the lobster. I'm not sure. It's, like, right by the Santa Monica Pier. But they have, the whole thing is they have lobsters. And this guy's going through this field that he, like, has to do. And then she is like, just being super rude. She's like, "Can you hurry this up?" And just oh, like, no. and then she was, he was talking about the lobsters they have, and she's like, "I don't need to know their whole backstory." And then she ordered a Bloody Mary at night, which was already questionable. And she goes, uh, first I want you to tell me how you would make a Bloody Mary, and then I'm going to tell you why that's wrong and how I would like it." <laughs> she said that to the waiter. Yeah. Oh my god. Like she was just a tyrant. Um, but I dated her for like a little bit. <laughs> for, <yeah. laughs> Like, wow. Went on like only went on what seven dates. <laughs> um, yeah, that was like the first person I dated, and then COVID happened, and then uh, I think I've had well, I've had two girlfriends since, and just been you know I came out to my mom uh, when I was uh, I opened for Jeff Ross in Palm Springs, and I had all, all this gay material at the time. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you. So when did you start talking about it on stage? Uh, I started talking about it pretty, like, after that, after Thailand, I started, like, writing more jokes about it, and I got more comfortable with my sexuality, and I was, like, on the apps trying to meet more women, um, but I, and then I had this whole gay act, and I, and then when I was supposed to open for Jeff, I was, like, all these jokes I've been doing are really gay, and I'm watching, I was just blindside my mom, but doing all these gay jokes, um, so I, like, adapted my, my, my Boy, sat, Were you open for him in Orlando, and she came to the show? Uh, West Palm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I had up, I had changed everything around, and I was, and it was so clunky because it's like you know when you move part of a joke around, it's like you forget that there's callbacks, and it's just like yeah, I messed up the whole thing. I bombed, uh, and then I, I realized I even it was a weird audience though too. Like I, I did a joke about like the setup is that I'll never have an abortion, and then the audience just like cheered. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't even realize it's like the setup to a joke. <laughs> That's funny. I was in Belf. I've played in Belfast like yeah. six times, <laughs> and it's the only time. I, and I, I was doing a setup to a joke where I said uh, I was raised Catholic, mm-hmm. and the audience cheered. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I, like you're not gonna like the rest <laughs> of this. So funny. <laughs> I'd never get an abortion in the chair. <laughs> yeah, it was like standing ovation. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> I should have just said like conservative talking points the whole time, just did no jokes, and I would have killed it. <laughs> um, but I, I realized I was like, I, I can't be editing my set like that. I'm going to come out to my mom. And I came out to her on the highway on the way home, and she was like, the whole time she was like freaking out because she's like, driving on the highway. She's like, what? <laughs> and she was in denial about it for like a little. Oh, bit. so she didn't take it too well. No, she like. She took, she was just like, I feel like she thinks that she knows him more than anyone in the world. So the fact that there'd be new information, she just thought, that's crazy. Like, I think that. Or did she think it was like maybe like a, just a phase you were going through? I guess. So. Or she's like, you don't, you don't know. And also just, for her, it was like, you can't be gay, you're so feminine. Like, gay people. She had the idea that I had the gay people that were very masculine and they have short hair and they work at landscaping. Like, she thought like all of yeah. these things. Um, We're Birkenstocks. Yeah. yeah. And she's like, that's not you. Um, and I have learned, there's a lot of women who internalize that too. Like I, I dated, uh, the last girl I dated was, 
just trying really hard to be a lesbian stereotype because I think that it like gave her more of a sense of self by being this like stereotype of it. Um, but personally, I, I was... like in what, in what way she listened to Melissa Etheridge all the time. <laughs> no, it's just like there's all these like <laughs> that's a 20, <laughs> 20 year old <laughs> reference. <laughs> it's like, I gotta update my uh, oh, well, now it's Fletcher and it's horrible. It's like Fl- awful pop music. Fletcher, it's yeah, the new, new lesbian, yeah, unifier, <laughs> yeah. And she she listens to Fletcher, and she uh, she wears the snapbacks and the beanies because there's like a few memes about how lesbian wears beanies, so she does that. And there's a then she drinks oat milk because there's a stereotype that lesbians do oat milk. And it's wait just, a minute, I drink oat milk. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe maybe. I didn't again. It was, it was the 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 woman I was dating. <laughs> only drank oat milk so i <clears throat> i mean it's great yeah there's there's an all gay starbucks near me and they're always an all milk. gay starbucks yeah there's two starbucks next to me one has one gay person that like leads like the whole team like he's like their leader yeah and then this one is like they're all gay and like all, no one works all the, all, the, <laughs> all the coffee is served with glitter on the, on the top <laughs> no, they, I, they, I literally think they're just drinking all the oat milk because they're always out of it and always out of the cake pops so they're just eating cake pops and oat milk, and it's everything's late and everything's always a disaster. So it's like the secret is if you're gonna open a coffee shop, you should have one gay person, and they'll be your shining star. But if you have all of them, it's a they they don't do anything. Um, my Starbucks name is uh, Voldemort, but they <laughs> rarely say it. <laughs> I've never tried to do like another one. You always do Madison? Yeah, we just yeah. play it. Well, I do mobile order, so that's nothing. I don't think I... I mean, I guess I could change it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, how, so this is all, like, really the last few years that you've embraced your... Um, yeah. Y- your identity. Yeah, I guess it's been... It's Yeah, I think about it now. It's like, yeah, it's the last three years. And what a tumultuous time in America to uh, <laughs> to have an alternative lifestyle. It's crazy because so many people I know have came out in the last few years. Like COVID, like so many people came out and it's weird how like TikTok, a lot of people came out from TikTok because they didn't realize they were gay and the algorithm like learns like what you're like by what you like. And then these people realize like all my content is lesbian stuff. And then they're seeing all these like hot lesbians and they're like, oh, this girl's hot. This girl's gay. And then I know, and then all these girls are, are founding out they're, found out they're gay through TikTok. Like, that's been, like, a whole thing. Really? Like, yeah. I know, like, I feel like I know, like, 50 people who came out over over COVID who thought they were straight, and then the pandemic happened. And TikTok taught them that they were yeah. gay. Okay. Because <laughs> you and I were talking before we yeah. were recording um, that I started a TikTok account, yeah. and then I, I look at it, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's always, like, uh, young women with big boobs jumping rope and stuff, <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, you and... Another friend I talked to said, oh, that's your algorithm. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not looking up girls with big boobs. So, I mean, I I, 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 uh, I don't have a big boob preference. I think once you're on it long enough. It so, okay, so like... they maybe realized, maybe I do like big boobs. <laughs> maybe. If these women have realized they were lesbians through TikTok, maybe TikTok's telling me. Telling you you like. You, you like big boobs. You like big boobs and you like jumping rope. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So, um, yeah, wow. So, how uh, how has it made your comedy better, you think? Um, I think it's made me a more authentic version of myself, and I think that I, like, I talk about things in a more, it's maybe more vulnerable, because I'm, like, talking about things I wasn't prepared for, and I think that that's made me able to be more vulnerable on stage, because I'm usually not. I don't like to make eye contact with people. On stage. On stage, really? You yeah, I, I hate it. Oh, I, I, th- I think it's important. I used to avoid it the first 10 years. Now I look everyone in the eye. I need to get better at it. Because I think words come out of your mouth mm-hmm. more naturally when you look people in the eye when you talk. That makes sense. In real life. and mm-hmm. on, But that's my, you know, I mean. No, it's true. And I think people also, like, will laugh more when they know that you're engaging them or you're paying attention to them in a way. Yeah, they there's feel- some kind of connection, you think. Like, I know when I'm watching a performer and he looks me in the eye and Oh, he's talking to me. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. you, you want to laugh. He singled me out. Because <laughs> um, I, I absolutely loved you when I first saw you. I, You know, I didn't uh, meet you before you went on and you were on stage and I'm like, 
Oh, who's this little fearless, badass, <laughs> attractive uh, girl from Florida, and 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 talking this, um, you know, you had really dark material, mm-hmm. and then um, to be kind of so brave and open about your sexuality, I thought, oh wow, you know, you're yeah. not, um, um, you know, there's a lot of straight. White guys doing comedy, you know. There are. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're not. Um, you're not like your your average Joe comedian, you know. I try to. I, I love the dark jokes, and I also. I feel like I I, I look at my old material. I think you got a big big future, kid. <laughs> Thank you. I also I cringe when I look at when I hear my straight material too because it t- it kind of just sounds like everything else. It's hard to have an original take when you're straight. So I think maybe because also- everything's been talked about. I think so, yeah. So it's like, oh, like there's all these like different routes I think about now. I'm like, oh, this is a lot of the stuff's been untapped. So I think it's another way that helps you as a comedian because you have a unique perspective. Also, realizing you're gay later in life is kind of a unique experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the yeah. way you did it too. Yeah. <laughs> getting a prostitute in Thailand or a masseuse. I wanted a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I was so scared of women, and I was so terrified of being bad at it. Like I was so terrified to have sex with women and like not be good at it. I think because I'm. I don't like to be bad at anything. And I was like, I, I like figured out how to have sex with men. And I was like, I don't want to be fucking 25 and be bad at sex. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I hope like, you don't mind me saying this. Because when, when we first met and we hung out and talked a couple times, I said, you went down on a Thai prostitute? And you go, no, 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 no
No, I have uh, I have the bugs like my mom. Like I have I have the bugs that are preserved. Uh, are I went to a, a punk rock museum and they did this thing where they had a comedy show and it was closing down, so you get to take one thing off the wall when you left if you performed. Cool. And uh, it's preserved uh, cereal from the, It's like for some reason it's like all this different cereal from the 1950s. And it's just like a showcase of that. I have that on my wall. Uh, what did that have to do with punk rock? Um, it was just like a. It was it was like some weird absurdist kind of gift that they gave. I guess I forget who it was from, but uh, I think it was just like a gag gift that they that they that they made, and they thought it was funny all this time, and then they they kept it. Mm-hmm. So I liked it. <laughs> so well, that's cool to, to know that you're into like bugs and those kind of um, yeah the um, like. Butterflies that have been preserved and things like that. <laughs> and I have stuff from FSU. You know that they have that circus. They had like the the first cl- show that they did. I have like the first poster from it. Things like that. So. Same. What was that? The first show that they did the circus. They have a circus at FSU. Oh okay. Oh okay. I didn't know. That. It's so weird. They have like a you can just be a circus performer and go to college and it's like a class. It's a credit. Oh well. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And they teach you how to tightrope and they teach you how to like do all the stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so how do you, how is your experience in, in Los Angeles doing stand up? And do you think, um, the fact that you're out and open about, um, being gay, is, is that, does it help or hurt you? Um, I've, I've definitely had people distance themselves from me after i guess it would be a good protective we were talking about yeah. like a lot of the pervert guys and <laughs> yeah. and comedy and things so like, <laughs> be... maybe that is a that's a good protective shield now to have maybe yeah no one tries to uh oh i mean their own in their own way i feel like people don't try to fuck me <laughs> more like they used to <laughs> like i i really hated men for a long time when i was out here because it was like a lot of just getting hit on uh in such a gross way and like after aggressive... shows and stuff yeah and like in green rooms and stuff um, and, and it was also weird cause it's like, if I turn this person down, I can't work with them anymore. So you, I had to like, it was like such a nightmare navigating that. Yeah. So it's just easier just to not have to worry about it now. It's just like not an issue. Uh, but there's definitely been some people who like don't love that I'm gay. Um, and they, they just don't work with me as much or they don't talk to me as much. So that's, that's also been a downside of it. Um, but there's been more community. Like I think the other gay comics, I think there's like a sense of. I, that's one thing I didn't like about LA is they didn't have as much of a sense of community as like a Tallahassee did because it's such there was like fucking twenty comics so we were all really close and we'd ride together and we would constantly have writing sessions and we'd constantly do shows together and here LA is so much bigger and I also think people are kind of like in competition with each other so that sense of community wasn't as good but gay comics are kind of like their own little they like kind of a micro community in LA so I've gotten that from it which has been nice. Cool. Yeah. What are the biggest headaches from dating women? Like you said, that woman was a real nightmare. Uh, I would never go out with someone who was... I think that says a lot. Like, someone who's rude to servers. Or I would say, like, you can tell how complicated someone's going to be in a relationship by how difficult their Starbucks order is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, she has a difficult Starbucks order, too. She made me write it down so I'd remember it. Mm. Uh, it's... I don't know. I... There's more unhinged people that I've found dating women than I have with men. I mean, I guess that's not true. I was fucking beaten by a man, but <laughs> who had a gun arsenal. But there's been like that fucking guy. That's the <laughs> yeah. military guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he wanted to be in the military. That's, I couldn't when you told me that uh, before. I was just so shocked to, and you know, to think that you had been physically abused by someone. Yeah, he's a crazy person. He he uh, showed up to a show too when I first did stand up. Did I tell you he went to my second show? In Tallahassee? Yeah. Oh, no. He went to my second show that I'd ever done. Cleaning and... his gun up front. <laughs> he went on a date. Oh, no. He brought he, a date. He brought a date. Well. He sat in the front row. And I had a um, I had a restraining order against him, but a university restraining order. So oh, wow. So it only works on campus. And the club was, it was just like Oyster Shack, so it's not on <laughs> campus. So that so it wasn't in effect. And um, I tried to get the venue to kick him out. They wouldn't because they're like, well, he's ordering drinks and food. So they, they wanted him to stay. And it, that's so, if, <laughs> if you're spending money at a comedy club, you can do whatever the fuck you want. You really can. It's funny. I was at a club in Scottsdale. This guy was going to want to stand up and fight me. It was a heckler thing, a video yeah. I posted. 
But this guy was like coked out of his skull and he's interrupting the whole show. Mm -hmm. And the club goes, yeah, but they got like a $500 tab going. (laughs) They wouldn't kick them out. They were fucking up the show for everybody. But like they were getting cocktails and they had had food and yeah. I mean, it's... Well, I, he wasn't even spending that much money. He just probably got a few oysters, which were like a dollar a piece and some beer. But he was, they didn't want him to go. And uh, I had to perform in front of him, and it was like my second show ever. So like I was not prepared for that. And uh, so I, I get up there, and I... You ever dating an abusive military guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what my friend... With a lot of guns? <laughs> <laughs> my friend Jason's like, just address it immediately so you don't think about it. Okay. At the top of your set. So... I did, and I, I made a joke about how I, I said I, I, did, I used to date this guy who had a premature ejaculation problem, which he did, and he stood up and just went, woo, like really loud, and like put all this attention on him, and I was like, see, I said, I haven't even gotten to the punchline, and he's already <laughs> he's already doing that, um, and then he, uh, and then they, uh, they like, they got like a laugh, and then I, and then I just completely crumbled, like I, I was so nervous by the fact I just called him out, and he just did this crazy display in front of everyone. It was hard to like go back into material, and I just totally fucked up. And uh, that was like the hardest I think I've ever bombed. But I think that's fair because it's a crazy circumstances. Tough situation. Yeah. Yeah. So and the guy had physically abused you before. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that's that's a tough spot. Yeah. It yeah. was a uh, kind of. Was that like the toughest gig you've ever done? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that doesn't get much worse than that. I mean I've done. There's uh, some shows that I went to. I showed up and they. The whole venue had a uh, Hillary for prison shirts on, <laughs> and they used Trump. Hillary for prison. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they used the Trump yard signs to wallpaper the entire restaurant. Mm. And I looked at my set. I was like, Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any jokes you're gonna like. <laughs> um, what has been your greatest victory in comedy? You think so far? Uh, being able to follow Bill Burr, I think. Uh, I think that was like pretty like and doing very well. And Where that, was that at? Uh, Jeff Ross had a little co- like coffee pop up. Uh, I was really happy with that. Also, I was really happy with my uh, with my Netflix set that I gave, and I think that the, and my friend who's been following me my stand up for a while, he actually he got me this job at MTV. He was like, he's saying that I'm really progressing in stand up, and he can see it like how far I've come in like the past four years. So I guess it's good that I'm getting better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that he can see it, and that someone who knows me well. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I could tell you had something special when I saw you, you know, and you. Uh, wanted to be your friend. Thank you. You know, because <laughs> you're from Florida, and um, <laughs> you're cool. What is the darkest, most twisted joke you've ever written? Uh, it's the darkest joke I've ever written. I guess it's the one about the joke I do about, about Amazon. About how the, at their warehouse, they uh, this woman got fired for having a miscarriage on the job, and I said I would have promoted her because it's the ultimate two-day delivery. It's <laughs> 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 a pretty dark joke. <laughs> what has uh, what well, like what, what do you what what do you dream to do? Like, do you want to have your own? I want to have my own show. Sitcom or sketch show or what's what's the dream of Madison Sinclair? Do you have you ever? Have you ever heard? I don't know. It's so annoying to ask if you've heard my podcast. But have you heard? Ma- have you even like heard of Madison Pi? The thing I do. I I, I, I think you told me about it. You like to yeah. talk about like obscure crimes. No, I I like they're not even like crimes, but they're like personal mysteries I want to solve. So like the first time my mom wanted to know uh, if my dad cheated on her in the course of their marriage because he randomly shaved his balls one day. So I like, got a voice changer and pretend he's a real estate agent. And I like, called and like pretended that I was gonna like I wanted to buy a house, but I'm going through divorce. And I just got really comfortable with him. And I told him I said, I want to buy a house for me and a smaller house for my ex husband because uh, he cheated. And I said, Well, I don't know that he cheated. And uh, I said he shaved his balls randomly. Do you think he cheated? And then immediately he started laughing and he goes, Yeah, if he shaves his balls, something's going on and everything. He's totally told on himself. So, well, if there's any listeners who's thinking about shaving their balls, I just <laughs> want to remind them that. Um... The manscaped um, weed whacker. I'm not. I'm sorry. The, the lawnmower is the perfect instrument for for shaving the balls. Uh, I, I I I have uh, new people that are um, uh, are sponsoring the podcast. This oh yeah, episode. this episode. Really? It's, it's, it's manscaped. Is it? 
<laughs> yeah, and <it's, laughs> what a perfect... they specialize in these kind of <laughs> items. So it's perfect that you bring this up. You can yeah. you can shave your balls. You can, you can <laughs> your tank. You trim your 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 no your tank. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> That's that's spending a little too much time in the crotch area, but yeah, you can really tighten things up with uh, these products. So I'm I'm really glad that you brought this up. <laughs> but essentially, I would like to make that a show, and we've been trying to pitch it. So I think that would be. Did your father cheat on your mom? Yeah, he did. Yeah, and so I've they, for I do all these. And the me. woman he did it with just couldn't stand hairy balls. I guess so. She's like, you need to get rid of that. So listen, I, 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 <laughs> if I'm going to be a home wrecker, I want to get a couple things straight. Here. <laughs> If you show up with some overly hairy balls, <laughs> I'm not going through it. Through with it. Also, if you're going to cheat on your wife, I think the moral of the story is that you should act. You should at least have a moment where you go, hey, look what I did for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, you just like hit it. It was in the shower. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> got to be a dead giveaway. Yeah. What other uh, investigative reports are you doing? Uh, the last one, someone at, called and asked if I'm gay. So I like did the mystery of I'm gay. Uh, someone shit in front of our house. Uh, so I wanted to find out who did um, it. On Wilshire? Uh, no, that would have made sense. It oh, was in, at Apopka. In yeah. Apopka, wow. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, I was I was going to do a swab with Ancestry DNA. To oh, see if to send in some of this shit? That's hilarious. And what's, what was surprising to me is they said that they wouldn't, if it was shit, they wouldn't accept it. But... They said that I could take someone's DNA without their knowledge and submit it to DNA. Wow. Yeah, I was like, I said, do I have to have, like, their consent? And she's like, whatever we send, we'll test. <laughs> so that's insane to me if you want a DNA test something. But they won't test the shit. No, she said, well, I said, what would happen if I sent it to you? And she goes, we would probably throw it away. Wow. Um, but we ended up finding out it was a it was a bobcat. So this is the show you want to do about investigative reports about... Certain things from your life. and Yeah, or like, and just helping other people. Like, I, I wanted to solve people's really mundane mysteries. And then I, I find, like, interesting pathways with it. I think that would be really interesting, or just having my own show. Because I love Nathan. You've watched Nathan for You? No. It's the best show ever created. It's so good. Nathan for You? Yeah. What is that? It's Nathan Fielder. And it was it was on Comedy Central. And everything is he, uh, he went to business school. And he tries to, he, like, has these plans to, like, help these businesses. But, like, they're... It's almost a prank show because it's like he's fucking with these people, but they go along with it because he's on TV and he thinks their business is going to get exposure. And he just makes people go for all these like insane ideas. Like one of them was a who's this real estate agent wasn't doing that well. And he's like, you should you should you should market yourself as the ghost realtor. And you prove that you say all your houses are ghost free. And he had these like crazy people that would go into the house and like make sure that he's like was detecting ghosts in each of them. And then they would do like a like a cleansing ceremony. It's all of it's just it's very it's very smart it's very well written, like almost everyone who loves it like usually you would love it it's it's really good. I would like to do something similar to that because it's unscripted but it's also its own thing. I don't know that or like a some kind of show. I don't know if I want to do a sitcom, but sitcoms are hard. Yeah, it's I used to shit on them and then now I realize like one of my my old managers was like he's like because he was working on this big sitcom. One of his clients is on it. And I like. I said I hate those multi cams. And he goes, "How about this?" He goes, "You can talk shit about this show if you can write a, a temp script for it." And then I started realizing it, everything is a setup punchline, setup punchline, setup punchline. They're not great jokes, but it's a hard format to really crack and like have this A storyline, the B storyline. Yeah. And it's actually a pretty complex formula, and I think that's why they're all just like not that great because it's yeah. so difficult. What is the best advice you've ever been given as a comedian? Oh, uh, Jeff Ross always says, uh, enjoy the process, which I think is nice. Because it's like, you're never going to get to a point where you're like, oh, I've done it. I'm happy now. It's like, you're always going to want more. Yeah. So you should enjoy every portion of your career. True. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to the wonderful world of getting to know Madison Sinclair? I'm going to tell people to... Uh, but, <coughs> To buy my booty shorts. Oh yeah, oh my God! You do the you, you you're, you're surviving off of booty shorts. Yeah, <laughs> my booty short empire. I like make booty shorts with like custom facts on the butt because like and I have sad facts about global warming and prison reform because my my thought is that if you put something on the, on an ass, people will read it. So I just put sad facts on. So and what is what is like the tell us the 
uh, prison reform and the other ones what uh one one of them is a uh, in by 2025 there will be more plastic in the sea than fish um one is uh there's more prisons than schools in america and uh one of them is 96 percent of murders committed by men uh <laughs> so just things like that and uh i i i did one recently that was uh it was it was about how uh land ownership is only one percent women but that's that sense changed but it was it was only from the un i was going to make that a pair hmm. yeah. yeah and so you and you'll custom make different shorts yeah did people um give you a sentence or a slogan yeah like so, so someone said i'm a real estate agent uh, let me know, like, give, give me a pair of shorts, and I just put open house and an arrow to her asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Things like That's that. That's funny. I told yeah. you a couple months ago, you 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 hadn't returned a um, couple of texts that I sent you, and I was, <laughs> was going to request some shorts. What shorts would you make for a friend who doesn't text back? <laughs> but then you got back to me. Um, you should have sent that text. It would have been funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy that um, we had this chance to sit down and, and talk. You yeah, know? it was really fun. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan, and it's just going to be wonderful watching your star trajectory. <laughs> Thank you. And so once you make it and you have a lot of money, what are you, you going to buy a Popka, or are you going to move back to Windermere? What's the plan? <laughs> I will. Uh, my goal is just to buy a house one day. I don't know. I don't, if I can, uh, hopefully one day here, but, or a townhouse, or anything I can purchase. I just want to be, I mean, as much as I would love to move to Joshua Tree and become like Oh, a you're one of those. Everybody's yeah. moving to Joshua Tree now. It's, it's nice, but then I had a friend who moved out there and he was like, yeah, it's nice for the first four months. And then you realize... There's nothing to do here. You, well, yeah, that and it's like a bunch of like bigots. Like he's Jewish and he's like, they don't really like Jewish people out here. And mm. he's like saying that his neighbors are like, he has nothing in common with. And they all like, collect guns. And some of them are prepping for the end of the world. So oh, okay. it's a lot of that. Yeah. I like yeah. I like I love Joshua Tree. I'll go out there every couple of years, drive around, yeah. love it. It's I, great. I, I wouldn't want to live there. You really? I like living in the city where the <laughs> where the shows are and the comedy clubs and uh, <laughs> where music acts <laughs> of, of uh, certain caliber give concerts and stuff. You know. I mean, yeah. I, I, like, I like you know, major league baseball things like that. I'm such a hermit. I could I could not see people for six months and be so happy. <laughs> really? Yeah. So are you dating someone now? No, I broke up with the last girl I was dating. What was wrong with her? She was uh, really bad at communication, um, was the thing. And uh, I, I texted her, I said, hey, is everything okay? You seem a bit off. And then she responded, and she's like, oh, I'm having doubts about our relationship or whatever. Mm. And I had been with her for like 48 hours. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. We, we don't have to be together. And then she got really upset because I guess she wanted me to be like, no, I'm sorry. Like, why, why are you doubting being with me? But I was just uh-huh. like... <laughs> She didn't it was like that. Trick, <laughs> yeah. And you failed. <laughs> and then she, I came back and she was all upset. She's like, I didn't want to break up. I was just like, didn't know if I wanted to be with you. And my thing is, I don't want to be with anyone who doesn't know if they want to be with me. Yeah. And uh, it just didn't feel like it was the right relationship. Also, she said I had not drank for like a year, and she said she would only be with me if I drank. Mm. So like, I had started drinking again to be around her, and I'm like, my body does not tolerate alcohol well. I just like should not. Drink. Yeah, you told me uh, that. Well, I think the last time I saw you, that you were you were. This is like two or three months ago. That you, yeah. you said you were boozing it up pretty hard. You said that <laughs> the lesbian crowd you were running with were uh, yeah. were some pretty hard drinkers. Yeah, I well, that's something that's kind of difficult too. Is like how to neg- how to navigate like being in this. Because a lot of the gay spaces, they just fucking party and drink all the time, and a lot of people do drugs and stuff. And I don't do any of that, and I. Uh, and I, I was completely sober, and they just constantly want to go to, like, West Hollywood, which is, like, nightclubs where people dance, and they just do, you order a drink, and it's, like, half tequila. It's disgusting. Um, to the point that some of these girls think they're getting roofied, but really they just have such a heavy pour that these people are, like, there's, you, you'll leave, and people will literally be, like, sleeping on the ground. They're so drunk. Uh and I was just like, not that's not the kind of life I want to live. And she's she was in her mid thirties, and I was like, you shouldn't be blacking out in your mid thirties. It's just like, yeah, the only social socially acceptable time to be like blacking out consistently, I think, is college, and then you have to like <laughs> grow up and not do that anymore. And I think she was just living a really big party with lifestyle, and I just don't. I just would like someone who has like their life together a little better. 
You were more like a a, a homey relationship. Yeah. Uh, like the um, you, you want like um, a conservative lesbian. Yeah, <laughs> someone who like plays <laughs> board games <laughs> with or something. I don't know. Like the the happy home life. It's, yeah, and yeah. She, she she came from like a lot. So of you're, money. I mean, you're pretty mature for your age, then you know. I guess, or this girl. Because I didn't because like, you're 27. I didn't I didn't stop partying until I was 47. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I hit it hard <laughs> my whole life. I was just drinking heavily every night. Yeah. And uh, loved to party. And then yeah. now I'm, you know, that's I, 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 I enjoy Scrabble, and you know, <laughs> I, I like I like I like home life, you know. I guess I just, because I had to stop drinking, because I, I, like, had this horrible adverse reaction to alcohol, so I took a year off, and then I just realized how much better my life was when I didn't drink, and I was like, oh, I don't actually really need this, and my, every time I drink, my anxiety is horrible the next day, and I was like, this is kind of, my skin breaks out, it's a nightmare, and I'm just, now I've been cutting it out completely, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to stop this, and then the next is nicotine. <laughs> did your... What? Your... Do you want to say it, or am I... I don't want to give away your cards. My my what? Your nicotine. Oh, yeah. I said next... I'm going to stop nicotine next. Yeah. Yeah, okay. my vape. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to say you were vaping, but you're a vapor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. And that's because of her, because your friends got me into vaping. Okay, yeah. I'm, I, I told you, I'm, I'm, I started smoking cigarettes again the last couple of years. I know. But they're the hand rolled, so I'm like European. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I started smoking again when I was in Europe because, like, it was just like these, these people were like, oh, you, you want to stoke? And they like, they fucking roll it and stuff. And I'm like, this is so cool. I can't say no to it. And next thing you know, I'm like fully addicted to cigarettes again. Yeah. No, yeah. So I have a serious nicotine problem. And I stopped doing that nicotine lozenges yeah. uh, just like a week ago. So I told you I was having. I was, and it was really annoying for people listening to the podcast mm -hmm. where I would constantly be clearing my throat. Yeah. So now it's 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 um, a lot better. I've been curious yeah. about that because I was going to do that to stop them, but you don't recommend them? No, not yeah. at all. And okay. I decided it's better to die of lung cancer than to <laughs> constantly be clearing my throat on my podcast. <laughs> so you're welcome, listeners. Once you get the Manscape uh, lawnmower. Get yourself a pack of marbles. That's your next sponsor. <laughs> Um, you're so fun, and I'm 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 really happy to be your friend, and um, you know, um, anything you want to ask me? Um, what's the worst thing you've ever done? Oh, I'll tell you once we stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, well, yeah. <laughs> No, I, 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 I don't have anything to add. <laughs> Is there? Uh, There's like a movie playing in your head. You just went through like thirty different you're scenarios, think of different things. You're like, oh, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. But um, you know, um, is there any advice or words of wisdom that you would like to give to the people of the earth? Uh, I would say, be nice to people, and uh, be a good person, not a nice person. I guess that was my biggest issue in last relationship. Okay, anything that could, might help someone in their day-to-day -day lives other than... Other than that? Uh, oh, just... Uh, buy some shorts with a message on the ass? Buy some shorts with a message on your ass. Um, smoke cigarettes. Buy Manscaped products. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like your advice. This yes. is really good. And, uh, and, and wash your makeup off every night. If you wear makeup. If you don't... You don't have to. Because it, like, locks up your pores if you don't, right? Yeah. It's don't do that to yourself. <laughs> good, good. It's my good. advice. Okay, Madison. Well, long may you run, my friend. <laughs> long may you run. This has been fun. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Hooray. Tom Rhodes, you're a funny man. Tom Rhodes, you're an international comedian. Tom Rhodes, karate kick, baby. Oh yeah Tom Rhodes You're a groovy dude You go all Around the world Telling jokes To all of the people You are an international Comedian You're funny to everybody In every single country In the world I like you 
very much I think you're talented and very wonderful Tom Rhodes, you're the best guy in the world I wanna be your friend, you should call me sometime Here is my phone number, 603-644-0048 Yeah, yeah, yeah Tom Rhodes You're an international comedic sensation Tom Rhodes, I like to listen to your podcast. Tom Rhodes, you're the best man to ever walk on the earth. <laughs>